Cathay Pacific used to be one of the world's premier airlines, but over the years, they have faced a harsh new reality. With strong competition from Middle Eastern, low-cost, and other full-service East Asian carriers, especially from China. Their finances have suffered as a result, made infinitely worse by the pandemic with their hub, Hong Kong, having some of the strictest measures in the world. Now, Cathay Pacific is ready to grow again, but the airline is extremely frail, with low employee morale and a tiny root network compared to pre-pandemic. Considering all this, I'm willing to bet that the state of the airline will surprise you. Come along as I review their business class and premium economy from Seoul to Dubai. If you're new here, you might think, why listen to me? Who is this random dude? I'm Nonstop Dan, a half Sweden, half American who has been obsessed with airplanes for as long as I can remember. Over the past eight years, I've been lucky to call reviewing airlines my full-time job, and in that time, I've flown 150 different airlines, always self-funded. Nothing makes me happier than seeing you guys have an amazing trip after following my advice. So I hope this video helps you with your choices. Welcome to a cloudy April morning in Seoul, South Korea. After a few days back in our old home city, Oscar and I are starting a round the world trip, taking us to Dubai via Hong Kong and then Sweden for a few days before heading to New York. We opt to take a taxi to the airport for approximately $50 and pull up to Incheon's Terminal 1 at 8.35 a.m. ahead of our 10.10 a.m. departure. We're treated to views of our Cathay Pacific A350-900 from outside the terminal, which makes me so excited for this trip. Inside the beautiful check-in area, we quickly find the Cathay desks, breezing to the front of the first class line thanks to One World Emerald status. There is no premium economy line, unfortunately. This first leg is booked as a cash ticket and Oscar and I are looking forward to sitting together. But suddenly, we're given some interesting news. For the first time in my adult life, I have been upgraded from premium economy to business class for free. I booked this as a cash ticket in premium economy I'm a One World Emerald member, but not with Cathay Pacific, with British Airways, who are not even super close partners with Cathay. So the fact I was upgraded is pretty insane and rare and only happened because the flight is overbooked. Now, the thing is, I want to try Cathay's premium economy because I've never tried it. So lucky Oscar is going to get the business class seat and I'll stay behind in premium with some stranger next to me. It's my special day. Wow. That is truly a first for me, and what an incredible perk. It's kind of crazy to think that Hong Kong was still closed a few months ago, Cathay Pacific wasn't flying any passengers, and now the flight is overbooked. But with that, how about we check out what awaits on the Cathay Pacific E350-900. This aircraft comes in a three-class configuration with 214 economy class seats in a 333 layout, 28 premium economy seats in a 242 layout, and 38 business class seats in a 121 layout. My seat today for the first flight is 32A, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend. Instead, I'd either go for row 30, the bulkhead, or 33 to enjoy a little more space. In business on the following flight, Oscar and I are seated one behind another in the business class mini cabin because it doesn't get much cozier than having the entire window seat side to yourself. Although note that these seats are served last and are not private during boarding since people are walking past. So with that, are you ready to see how the Cathay Pacific experience holds up in 2023 after years of restrictions and financial problems? We scan our boarding passes and then exchange them right before heading down the jetway and hopping on board. Given my elite status, I'm the very first on board and what a lovely looking cabin this is. I'd like to point out here that 242 is a standard premium economy configuration on the E350, but some airlines like Taiwan's China Airlines or shocker Lufthansa have a 232 configuration instead, which is obviously a lot more spacious. It's most noticeable when looking at the armrest here, since they're not quite wide enough to avoid having to fight over them, which really sucks. Pretty much everything else is a world apart from economy. The seat reclines into to a comfortable position that instantly puts me into snooze mode after takeoff. There is plentiful storage with a seat back pocket, this little compartment under the screen, and a tablet holder up here. This is like a slightly tighter version of most short haul business class seats or first class seats in the US. But I'm so, so glad I didn't take the business class seat and stayed here because I learned a valuable lesson. Much of the time, especially on daytime flights, premium economy is significantly better value for money than business. All those things you miss in economy like 
adequate space and recline are addressed. So for most people, especially families, I'd recommend considering this cabin as long as the price is less than half of what they're charging for business. On the side here, we have some seat controls, a small drink table, and a remote which controls our pretty big touchscreen. Being on the A350 always feels like such a pleasure with the high ceilings. What a ride for a three and a half hour flight. There's no pre-departure service, at least on this flight, but our entirely sold out A350 is fully boarded in a staggering 20 minutes. And we push back at precisely 10.10. How different is the in-flight experience from economy, at least on a flight this length? Keep watching to find out. living my premium economy life in 32A, Oscar has been enjoying a pre-departure beverage, a spacious direct dial access seat, and more personalized service in the very first row of business class in seat 11D. What an amazing treat to get that for free. His meal is served premium economy style since he wants his pre-ordered VOML, and it looks pretty good with some mock meat, which is standard for catering out of Seoul. As he enjoys that, 30 minutes after takeoff, it is meal time down back. My pre-ordered VGML is delivered first and it looks okay. The portion is quite large and I love the more premium plating with real china, but when it comes to vegetarian dishes, I almost always prefer to order the oriental option when that's available. I'm glad we can compare both side by side in this video to emphasize that point. While I'm eating, I check out the entertainment system, which is shockingly extensive. I was almost certain it would be bare minimum following the pandemic, but my goodness, this is one of the best selection of onboard TV shows I have ever seen. The onboard headphones are quite good too. There's also supposed to be wide Wi-Fi on board, but the crew informs us that it doesn't work on today's flight, sadly. For that matter, neither does the tail camera, which is one of my favorite features on the E350. To my surprise, the curtains to economy haven't been closed, and only after the trays are cleared, which takes 65 minutes, yikes, are they finally closed, at which point we're halfway to our destination already. After this, I decide to cuddle up with a very thin blanket, which is the extent of our bedding on the shorter flight, and get some work done. There is dual charging and a USB port to keep both passengers fully powered up here, and before I know it, we're cruising over Taiwan. And just as I'm getting desperate to use the lavatory, the passengers in front of me recline, and I realize oh no, it is impossible to get out. This is without a doubt one of the biggest drawbacks of this type of premium economy seat, and I don't know what I'd do on a long haul flight requiring multiple visits to the lavatory. Before landing, I finally make it there, and unfortunately, these are shared with economy. So the wait can be quite long, but they're decently spacious and comfortable at least. One thing I'd like to mention as we approach, the service on board is regular economy service with minimal smiles, effort, and no personalization. But premium economy is mostly about the seat anyway. I do find Cathay Pacific's crew to generally be a step below many other East and Southeast Asian carriers for some reason, which is really a shame because the competition in the region is brutal. The views of Hong Kong as we approach are stunning despite the haze. I can't believe that this incredible city is open to tourists again. We touch down on the newish runway, it's my first time touching down here, and taxi past the enormous expansion project to our gate. Geek is going absolutely wild seeing all these Cathay jets lined up being prepared to increase capacity in the near future. I'm so excited to show you probably the highlight of the Cathay Pacific experience, but first, every video people ask how can so many people still travel like this in times like these? Well, as these guys would know, the key is having your money working for you even when you're on the road. Whatever your plan is, this year has been incredibly challenging to say the least. You see this beach? Four out of five vacationers might have planned to come to a beach just like this, but have had to change their plans as a result of prices soaring. After all, how can we get our money working for us when even the pros say the system is breaking down? Well, today's sponsor and my longtime partner, Masterworks, has already distributed net proceeds from $45 million in sales to people just like you. Maybe even some of you watching this since I've been talking about Masterworks for well over a year now. See, Masterworks platform gives you access to one of the most unique luxury assets in the world. 
fine art. And while this art was often exclusive to millionaires, Masterworks has opened up the market so you don't have to spend millions of dollars on a piece of art or art expertise. Every single sale they've had so far has generated back a profit to their users, so it's no wonder over 700,000 people are already using it including me. As I've said before, they have a wait list, but my viewers get a way to skip the line and join immediately if you click that link at the top of the description right now. Let's talk about the transit experience. If you have your onward boarding pass, it'll be quite smooth sailing. But if you don't... So we need to go to the transfer desk because they wouldn't issue Oscar's next boarding pass in Seoul. The problem is that almost all the transfer desks are closed. All the ones where we arrived are closed. We have literally been walking for maybe 10 to 12 minutes trying to find a transfer desk at an airline's main hub. That's not how it's supposed to be. Yeah, having only one open transfer desk at your main hub is certainly a choice. Speaking of choices, whoever chose this design for Hong Kong Airport is incredible. Coming back after three and a half years, my breath is taken away by how stunning the terminal is. Everything is spotlessly clean, it's bright and feels modern despite its age. What a joy to be back here. We head all the way to the wing, which is unfortunately the only first class lounge that's open since the iconic and world famous Pier Lounge is still closed. I'll be showing you around both the first class section, which I have access to thanks to my One World Emerald status, and the business class section today, so there is a lot to see. How do the lounges compare? Let's find out. Welcome to the Wing First Class Lounge. It's striking out quintessentially Hong Kong luxury this lounge is. The different seating areas, whether around the buffet, magazines, or the self-service champagne bar are all tastefully designed and oh so comfortable. We head straight for the restaurant called The Haven with free a la carte dining. I mean, what a menu. Within five minutes of ordering, our clay pot tofu and vegetables are served. They are delicious just as expected. The fruit plate is a color and flavor explosion that goes well with our signature ginger forest and mango dream drinks. With only three hours remaining to departure, there is no time to diddle daddle. So I drag Oscar away from the haven to the famous cabanas. What is that you ask? Yes, this is free inside an airport terminal if you have access to the first class lounge. Layovers don't get better than this. 45 minutes of utter relaxation later, it's time for some more food. So we pass by the first class buffet and head to the business class lounge. While the design is almost the same, the immediate impression is, wow, there's a lot of people here. We navigate through the crowds toward the noodle bar, which is the closest to an a la carte section you'll find in the business class lounge. And I give the staff a good laugh when I order four red bean buns since they don't know I'm sharing them with Oscar. I also grab a bunch of vegetable dumplings from the buffet here as well. What else am I supposed to eat in Hong Kong? At 3.55, one hour before departure, we pack up, board the train to gate 48, and get in line for boarding, which is supposed to begin at 4.15. After three weeks of travel in Japan and Korea, timeliness has clearly become something we take for granted because it's another 20 minutes before boarding begins. Just 20 minutes before we're supposed to push back. Again, my status lets us be the very first on board our second A350 of the day, and we head to our seats in the adorable mini cabin. This is my favorite place to sit on this plane and most planes, specifically in the window seats since sitting in the middle is pretty pointless if you're hoping to have a couple seat in this configuration. I absolutely adore Cathay's cabin finishes. The seat simultaneously feels luxurious and remarkably homey and cozy. Cathay also has my favorite version of the reverse herringbone with a video monitor that folds out from in front of you. Unlike on most airlines nowadays where you put your feet into a cubby below the entertainment screen and the tray table, this seat is much more open and free and really has no drawbacks in comparison. There is also so much storage between this bin, the side surface, and your little locker. Your seat controls and remote are easily accessible without accidentally hitting them all the time, and charging is smartly placed on the side unlike the British Airways club suites for example. The privacy is also so good that a door isn't necessary. This is my favorite reverse hair 
herringbone seat in the world even more than Qatar Airways business suite. There is a raisable armrest on the aisle side and something really unique, a raised bed extension. How awesome. After boarding is completed, the pre-departure service begins with a choice of champagne, water, and Cathay Delight, their signature drink made with kiwi juice, coconut milk, and mint. I opt for that, and although I'm heartbroken, my favorite oriental breeze is a thing of the past, this is not a bad second choice. That is followed by hot towel service, not the most luxurious one, but I'm glad to have it regardless. Drinks and towels are also offered in premium economy before takeoff on this flight, which is a nice touch. At 5.10 p.m., 15 minutes behind schedule, our sold-out flight pushes back to gorgeous mountain views. I take this chance to peruse the menu in anticipation of today's in-flight dining, and this looks so nice, especially the drinks. If only it was nice in practice. Stay tuned. Suddenly, we stop our taxi to the runway and the captain comes on. We have a problem. A passenger has reported smoke coming out of the engine, which is normal on the A350 by the way, but because of that, we need to have our engine inspected. So we swerve to the side on the taxiway while a ground team takes a look. 15 minutes later, our captain informs us that we need to return to the gate to have a mechanic take a closer look. In this moment, I feel overwhelmed with gratitude about two things. Firstly, I feel grateful that this almost never happens to me despite my extremely frequent travel. Secondly, there's no better time to be sitting in a premium cabin with direct aisle access and plentiful space than during tech delays. More on how I paid for it at the end of the video. As we pull into our new stand, I expect a quick look into the engine. Not this. Okay, we are in our meltdown era. Babies start crying, people start asking for medications and drinks, the crew service some warm nuts to keep us distracted. It's really all quite the adventure. I decide to take this chance to dive into the amenity kit since Lord knows when we'll be leaving. I initially misread this and think the kit is from Tom Ford, but it's from Bamford, whatever that is. It's stocked with all types of useful contents. I like it. We also get a pair of slippers, which surprisingly are not too small for me, so they go on as I put on the movie I'd been eyeing on my previous flight, Triangle of Sadness. My goodness, I'd recommend everyone watch it because it's one of the most genius, mind-opening movies I've ever seen. I ended up hating the whole two and a half hours of it, but it is simultaneously amazing. <laughs> Outside, the sun eventually sets, and at 7.20 p.m., two hours and 20 minutes behind schedule, we push back for the second time. Let's hope this is not a case of third time's the charm. Will we make it? Yes. This flight was obviously supposed to be in daylight, and given my long day at this point, I apologize if the following sequence of footage is giving three-stop budget Dan, not non-stop Dan. There is in-flight Wi-Fi with limited bandwidth, which isn't specified, but the rates are quite good. You know what's not good? Like at all? The meal service. It begins an hour after takeoff with this tray being plonked down. My appetizer is at least elaborately presented, which makes up for the underwhelming taste. The Cathay Delight is a good distraction too, so no worries. A full 35 minutes later, this extremely sloppily presented tiny main course is served. Another 45 minutes later, the plate is cleared and dessert, a measly plate of fruit, is served. Presumably, Cathy is understaffing their A350s because that is a ridiculously slow meal service. The crew doesn't seem to be bothered by much, to be honest, since they also keep letting premium economy passengers use the business class lavatories, which is not normal. Speaking of the lavatories, they are perfectly fine. There are four in business class, which is great, so the wait is never too long. Back at the seat, it is nap time. While their bedding is just okay, this is a great seat for sleeping given the lack of restrictions around the feet and knees. Again, definitely the best reverse herringbone seat out there in my opinion. Good night. Good morning, or good evening, or whatever this is. Hi. It's pre-landing meal service time served just 35 minutes before touchdown. This is probably my favorite meal of the day as it got the memo that it's supposed to have flavor. The portion is great considering my body clock thinks it's 4 a.m. With that, we approach Dubai, touch down, and taxi to our gate. So what do I think about Cathay Pacific? What do I think of her? Yes. 
I don't think of her. I actually think about them a lot because I'm so torn. The ground experience in Hong Kong is incredible. I love everything about it besides the lack of transfer desks. The lounge, the views, the airport itself are all top notch. On board, the hard product, especially the business class seat is fantastic as well. It's the soft product that leaves me with mixed feelings. It's like some parts are super great and some parts are so disappointing. I almost can't think of another airline with such inconsistencies, which makes Cathay difficult for me to place. To be honest, I won't be seeking them out with so many good competitors in the region between the lackluster food and service. But I'm still surprised that things aren't worse given what the airline has gone through. So how much did I pay? Well, one of the best word sweet spots in the world, which I understand has limited use, is using Alaska Airlines miles on Cathay Pacific from Europe or the Middle East to Asia. Actually, you can only go to or from Hong Kong on these tickets, but if you manage to find a seat, you can fly like I did from Hong Kong to Dubai for 30,000 miles one way in business class. That is absolutely unbelievable. And definitely a redemption I would repeat. Thank you so much for watching guys. And until I see you in the next video, fly safe.